Okay, so welcome to the best panel of this summit, not biased at all. <laughs> um, I also, on a side note, love how we're now using FTX as a swear word in many ways. Um, completely understandable. So I'm fortunate enough to be joined by an amazing panel. Um, as was mentioned, we have Guerra, who leads crypto for MFS Africa. We have Alou, who leads um, ch his ecosystem need for Cello. We have Shant, Shant, no, Shant, no, sorry, um, who's the CEO of Encryptus. Shodipo, who's the global head of developer advocacy for Polygon. Um, and then last but not least, myself. So I'm chief of staff at Nestcoin, which is a crypto venture studio building different products for the global south. Um, we've most notably focused on gaming and also on and off ramping protocols. So let's get to it. So let's start with setting the scene. Um, for those who are new to Africa, crypto, etc. What does the African crypto scene look like today versus what did it look like five years ago? I'm going to start with you, um, Alou, because you've been in this scene for quite some time doing loads of different things, so it'd be great to hear your thoughts. All right. Thank you very much. Um, actually, crypto right now in Africa is still, just as it is over the world at its infancy stage. Uh, the only difference there is that, you know, Crypto adoption in Africa is actually being driven by a consumer, uh, and compares to what, what we see in other regions like Europe and maybe other trans, you know, continent like maybe the United States and you know other countries, where we have more enterprise adoption, like you know, compares to Africa, right? So, I would say because of the fact that we have more consumer adoption, more consumer-driven adoption in Africa, it's you know, naturally being driven and, you know, everyone still feel more comfortable using it as the day goes by. Mm -hmm. And right now, although the regulation is not really favorable in terms of, you know, <laughs> how people can use it, uh, for example, we have, you know, many central banks in Africa saying, don't touch crypto, right? Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you still see many people trying to use different solutions, creating of peer-to-peer -peer solutions, like what we see in Nigeria in 2021, you know, uh, it, it just shows that this adoption is just starting, right? And uh, compared to what is happening five years ago where we have just few number of people, I mean, people that are in crypto five years ago are currently, we, we are going to call them hojis of crypto right now, yes. right? So I, I believe that in the next five years, we are going to look, you know, back to this year, I say, you know, we have really gone a lot. Uh, we have really done a lot and we have really gone far compared to what, what we have five years ago yes. and, you know, looking at the next five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Shadipo, um, on this as well from your perspective. Okay. So, uh, where Africa is right now on crypto, one good thing is it's really not where we were before. And that's a good thing. It shows that innovation is happening and we're making progress. So it might, it might not really be, for example, if you look at how, um, for example, we got chat GPT, it came out and went through the roof and like all of that, right? So um, AI right now is doing pretty well. It's a great ecosystem, it's doing pretty well right now. And adoption is really increasing um, specifically because there um, were use cases that um, a company called OpenAI created say, hey, um, we want to be some called chat GPT and we just want to create a use case here, right? So um, in Africa right now, we see a bunch of companies coming up and they say, people say, hey, don't we have enough exchanges? We don't have enough. We don't have enough companies. We don't have enough. Web we need more. We need more people to come up with companies on the blockchain, building real world solutions to problems, right? That's really what we need right now. But um, my, my point here is we are not where we were before, and that's a really good thing, and we need more founders, more people, more developers to build solutions. For example, we had at Polygon, we hosted the blockchain, the, um, the Polygon Bootcamp Africa. Um, specifically, the idea was to basically... Um, um, is, is a two thing, so it's a learning phase and a hackathon phase. So the idea was specifically, right, we want to help people, want to train people, want to help them understand how the blockchain works, I want to help them build products. That's the idea. Not just say, hey, I just want to build a simple or deploy my first, first smart contract. Yeah, that's a good thing, right? But at the same time, right, we want, to we want you to basically build, like, real-world products that, like, 
solve problems. That's what we're looking for. For, for example, when the hackathon results came out, we saw people building amazing stuff. For example, Crypto Momo from Uganda. Um, like a bunch of other companies came out to build amazing solutions. Crypto and USSD, different solutions. So specifically, these are the kind of things that we're looking for that is going to increase the adoption of crypto. Um, simply take crypto mainstream in Africa. So we simply just need um, developers, founders, um, that can also collaborate with developers. So specifically, right, it takes a unique kind of person to bring um, three people, to people together who are developers, bring them to work together and like build something usable. Right, so we need founders also who have like this leadership mentality and like for example some developers don't know how to like they just care about writing good code. Like they don't they don't know about running a company, but like tell hey I want to build this, they will build it out for you. So having a founder say, Hey, I have a leadership mentality and this is a problem that I'm facing. I see people facing this also, and I think um, a solution around this to make a lot of sense. Bring developers together, um, build something and like put it out there, right? We, we cannot have too much, right? We're trying to take crypto mainstream, that's the goal, and we can have too much solutions. If you see a problem, build something. But um, be definitely do a market research first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I know just a moment ago we were talking and you, were, you mentioned that you also have some interesting thoughts on this, especially why, why Africa, right? So if you think about it, what we've seen is the last, the last waves, you know, it's been crypto, crypto has been treated almost as the ends rather than the means. And what we're seeing in the West is that the Western crypto scene is waking up to the fact that in reality the key utility for crypto is not in the West. Mm -hmm. It's in emerging markets and continents like we have on, on the, in the context of Africa. So why, why do you think Africa is so important for crypto in your, in your mind? It's funny actually, I started my crypto journey uh, with a startup from Kenya in 2016. And, uh, the rest is history because we ended up building a regulated models between bitcoins and money transfer. Of course, there were a lot of things within the gray area. However, um, I'm a numbers person and I like numbers. Uh, the numbers indicate that the, the investments, the VCs invested around $36 billion mm -hmm. last year mm -hmm. in, in the crypto funds, basically in the crypto businesses. Mm -hmm. Out of that $36 billion, 15%, that is almost $5.6 billion, came to the African ecosystem itself. The number of uh, startups increased from 700 something to 900, I think 30 or something, between 21 and 22. So if you look at these numbers, it indicates that A, Africa as a whole, as a continent, is becoming also a producer of blockchain, mm -hmm. rather than just being a consumer of blockchain. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the, the history, it always looks like uh, they were mostly consuming technology. But now at this stage, Africa is actually producing technology. They're producing ecosystems. A lot of startups are coming in. And also in terms of uh, crypto adoption uh, that, that my fellow panelist was mentioning moments ago, I mean, look at uh, top 20 countries and Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, and South Africa are among top, top uh, 20 which is almost 20% of the global crypto adoption is actually happening in Africa. Mm -hmm. So this, the numbers clearly indicate uh, that there is a change, there is a positive change that's happening in the region. But on the other side, I feel education is an important area because I've been in Kenya, like I've been coming here for the last six years, and specifically in the last week, I've been interacting with a lot of crypto companies. Even after the FTX, I know that's what the topic is about, mm -hmm. but it looks like education is still a big problem. A, among the crypto communities, and B, among the financial institutions mm -hmm. as well. If cryptos are not looked into with regulations, compliances, and controls, yes, it's a wild, wild west. Like, I mean, New York Stock Exchange, when it started about 200 years ago, mm -hmm. it was hub for gamblers. Mm -hmm. It used to be called as a gambling hub. Mm -hmm. But is New York Stock Exchange still a gambling hub? No. Uh, I think the answer is no. <laughs> but, uh, of course, then, you know, there are terms and conditions that's applied. But in cryptos, there's no terms and conditions. Yes. You don't know, like I, uh, I won't name the company, but I wanted to check with this tier one crypto exchange. As a user, I opened my account with them in 2017, yeah. and I'm governed by what laws? Yeah. They couldn't tell me yeah. that I, my, my account is, like, is with which territory, like yeah. with institution, which itself is ambiguous. So that's a bit of uh, numbers uh, 
for the audience and for the panel. So you ease me into the next topic that I wanted to discuss, which is regulation. But I guess before I jump into that, one thing I always like to say is typically when we're talking about crypto, it is always led by DeFi. And that makes sense, right? Usually that is what is leading, not just in the context of the continent, but more broadly and globally. But there is, of course, interest in projects happening and things that are happening on the continent outside of DeFi, whether that is in terms of the NFT and creator economy. And I think Africa is uniquely posed um, or positioned for that, especially in the context of Nigeria, where there's a closer relationship between tech and creators than we see in, for example, the West. They're, they're more closely interlinked. And so I would also say, whilst we are going to focus on DeFi, given the name and the focus, one thing I'd like everyone to take away is also to think about what is, when we're thinking about the future of crypto, think about things beyond DeFi, because it, it, it is coming. It's already happening on the continent. There are great communities, projects, etc., that are going on beyond DeFi. But as I said, you were leading me onto a really excellent topic, which is regulation in crypto, right? It's, in many ways, it's the elephant in the room. It varies hugely across the continent. I just came back from Zambia, um, where I was with the E Foundation, Vitalik, and also Zambian political elite. They were open. They wanted to look, listen and learn. You have countries like Botswana, which are also, you know, you can get a crypto license. And then you have other countries, which we shall not name, um, which are not as open to crypto. And so I would love to firstly, just for the, for the benefit of the audience, what does the crypt, current crypto regulation look like in some of the key hubs, crypto hubs on the continent? And how do we think it can evolve? Like what is the ideal, what does an ideal regulatory environment look like for crypto? I know you have a lot of thoughts on this, Moira. <laughs> um, so please. Well, yeah, I, I guess I'll start with kind of giving a snapshot of where I think crypto adoption has come in what regulation will follow, like on the continent specifically. So if we look at the continent versus the global north, uh, crypto adoption, crypto adoption was uh, DGENs in you know, America or Europe um, getting rich quick, you know, making tons of money in various DeFi pools, um, watching the line go up with various tokens. Um, the use cases here are a lot more real. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing people hedging for uh, mm -hmm. currency devaluation and inflation. Mm -hmm. People using um, stable coins to uh, move value. Mm -hmm. uh, folks are using um, you know, stable coins to do remittances. Mm -hmm. So the, there's real use cases here and it's actually kind of happened in a very grassroots way. Uh, if we look at uh, you know, the global north where the regulation uh, that, that's emerging right now, um, it's being led by you know, powerful uh, regulatory bodies that are trying to regulate institutions almost. Um, so institutions uh, with, I guess, retail users, like the individual person, as a bit of an afterthought. So in, in the States, we're seeing the, um, the FTC, there's uh, the Fed are now you know, wading into this space. Um, but I, I think that, 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 that the use cases there are so different. And a little bit, I, I, I hate to use the word frivolous because making a billion dollars is not fairly frivolous, mm -hmm. but um, they're not as, as, as like um, core, rooted in root, yeah, rooted in utility, like actual use cases that we see here. Yes. So we come to African regulation. Yes. Um, the regulators here are, I'd say some are scrambling to figure out how to regulate crypto. We're seeing some who will not be named uh, releasing a hasty CBDC, a central bank digital uh, mm -hmm. uh, currency. Um, that was quite hasty, it wasn't well thought out, it didn't solve for customer needs. And like, like I'm saying, people are actually using stable coins and crypto in Africa for actual use cases. Like, you know, this very, you know, the CBDCs that are, that are being explored and coming out are happening in a very reactionary manner. Um, so we're, we're seeing some regulators who've just completely shunned crypto and have said, you know, we're not touching it. Anyone who touches it in our country is doing something illegal. Um, but we're also seeing some curiosity. There's pools of curiosity happening in Uganda with, you know, the, there's the crypto sandbox going on there. In South Africa, Project COCA was uh, a CBDC uh, exploratory project with a consortium of banks and private institutions as well as regulators. So I think that in Africa, the regulatory approach needs to really consider the, the retail user. And like at the end of the day, what is a regulator's reason to be here? What, why, why are regulators doing their jobs to protect consumers at the end of the day, to protect also their economy? Yes. Um, so that, there's many things to consider there, but it takes a multi-pronged approach with, with private institutions, uh, large financial services like you know, the visas, the MFSs of this world, um, the, the MNOs, you know, the MTNs and, and Airtel, Safaricoms, but also a really strong grassroots um, movement. So we're seeing that with the Ethereum Foundation yes. in Kenya, Safari DAO is doing a lot of really cool stuff. So it it's just, I think it's going to 
need a lot of collaboration across the board. I think one, there was one interesting point that you raised in the mix of your larger statements, right? So if you think about it, what are the fundamental points of government in, in this context? Mm -hmm. It's to protect the consumer, but it's also to protect their economy. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges I, I feel with that we have to bridge when it comes to regulation on the continent is making regulators realize that it's not a threat to their capital controls. And especially because stable coins are key to crypto adoption on the continent. Um, how do we marry that, those two together? How, how do we make regulators feel at ease? And some of it is the regulators have to come in open-minded, but what more can we do on the continent to get to that golden standard or that ideal space? I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I think to me, you know, regulators are just very difficult, Yes. naturally, everywhere in the world, not yes. just Africa. Uh, but one of the things I feel like, you know, would be more reasonable to do is like more education within the community. Uh, many of them really doesn't even know, you know, many things about crypto. Like they just know, oh, it is crypto. No, we are not interested, right? Because maybe it is going to take our job, or mm -hmm. maybe it is going to like display some of the things we uh, we have capacity over, right? So, like some of the things we that I know that some of the uh, some of the like crypto organizations across different countries in Africa are doing is to like you know interface with the regulators directly. I know they are doing this in Nigeria. I I remember they do this in uh, Uganda recently as mm -hmm. well. I mean, I feel like continuous conversation, even though it might take some time, right? But of course, this kind of continuous conversation would really yield positive results. Apart from this, uh, one of the biggest negative things for us in this space is like the, like the recent issues of FTX and yes. other, you know, like the Luna issues, yes. right? So I think these kind of issues would also like bring more negative, uh, you know, awareness for us, right? Because it makes regulators have you know, say is over us and say, oh, we can't regulate this thing because you guys keep having more, you know, negative swipes in the space, right? So maybe w one of the things we have to do is like funders in the crypto space usually just needs to like make, make sure that the due diligence are, you know, really being done, right? So if we, ha if we have actually done our own due diligence, we have actually done our own assignment in the right way, mm -hmm. uh, we have the project that is, of course, uh, maybe not going to crash, right? And you know, I think with this, maybe the next couple of years, it is more easy for us to, you know, say, you know, we have been in this space for five years, we have been doing this, we have been doing this, and it's, we don't have any negative vibes, right? And another thing I, I think would also be, like, more useful for us is, like, to have real-world use cases yes. when it comes to adoption, right? Yes. You know, we have so many use cases that we can use crypto for. Yes. And before you can actually interface with the regulators, you need to show them that this is really Real. useful. Yes. And in which way, right? Yes. Payment use cases, you know, like for example, at Cell Foundation, there were, there were some of the recent uh, pilots that we ran in uh, Kenya here, with Sinch and Mexico. Uh, you know, this kind, of, this kind of use cases are the things you can take to the bank and say, hey, you can take to the central bank or even the regulator and say, hey, we are doing this with you know, this kind of reputable organization across yes. the world. And with this kind of use cases, you, you already have like a, you know, you already have like your hey one game going, you know, going you know, to these guys and say, we need you to regulate us so that we can keep doing this, right? Yes. So real world use cases that are actually very impactful within the community, you know, for the people, right? For the consumers. And of course, for the government as well, right? So we have so many use cases that we can always build upon, especially in Africa, right? Yes. I usually see something like crypto is more like useful in Africa than maybe any other region because we have many problems that crypto is already solving, right? Central bank in Nigeria bans us from using our card to make any payments. Booking my flight here, I have to use a crypto card, right? So those are you know some of the use cases that we need to like keep driving for mm -hmm. us to like you know be able to like interface with the mm -hmm. regulators, go to them with you know the right uh, you know the right vibes, the right you know, the right positive energy, right? Yeah. And be able to like have a positive conversation with them. I think okay, the so just, okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, go on. <laughs> you started before me. <laughs> Thank you. I think what is also happening in the crypto in, uh, industry is, uh, I'm on regulator side, by the way. Yeah. Uh, why? Because there are too many tokens out there 
Like there are 22,000 plus crypto coins out there and what are they doing? I'm sorry, I mean, if somebody is building a nice ecosystem, <laughs> but I'm saying some facts which may not be right. Mm -hmm. And when crypto companies we approach uh, with to regulators, uh, the reason I'm saying is I've dealt with regulators in Abu Dhabi, ADGM, Central yeah. Bank of Bahrain, Baffin, and EFCA. We ourselves are licensed by Austrac in the UAE and also by FIU in Lithuania. That's an authorization, mm -hmm. it's not a license. Now, most of the crypto entrepreneurs, uh, when they go and talk to a regulator, they say we are a DAO. A regulator is not going to understand what's what a DAO, what, what yeah. a DAO is. Yeah. They yeah. say we are DeFi. Yeah. They don't understand what is DeFi. Yes. But if you go and you say, okay, uh, this is how we do traditional business. Yes. This is how remittances were yes. done. But using our solutions, yes. remittance can be more efficient, yes. effective, uh, and it would add more value. Yes. That conversation, in my opinion, uh, is it's not happening with the regulators. Yeah. Number two is, imagine if I go to an investor and I tell them about the expenses first and not about what my product is, what my game plan is. And exactly what crypto companies are doing is, they're talking about how they're bringing a use case by moving money out. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear, at least in this part of the world, how are we going to bring more inflows to the country? I'm curious Sorry. to ask you, like, so what approaches have you seen like, with, regard, like, with regulators um, that have actually worked? Because it seems like everyone kind of is like, uh, we all have an agenda yeah. when we approach right. the regulator. Yes. Like, what approaches, like, because you're on the regulator side, like, what, what, what have you seen that is amicable for, for these kinds of interactions? And to add to that, also, you know, from your experience globally and in other regions of the world, what do you think we can adopt and slightly adapt in the context of the continent? Very good question. I think, uh, as I said, the first point is everything is not a token project. Mm -hmm. We should not approach the regulators by saying we have launched a token yeah. and this is what the token is supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's number one. Number two is we need to have some data, data from the traditional finance. Uh, I, I presume like cryptos, the use case is mostly we have seen in the, in the space of finance, right? Yes. Uh, sorry, certainly. <laughs> certainly, I mean, in the sense that uh, a is using cryptocurrencies, B is custody. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, I know that we have, uh, there's something more to do, discuss about FTX, yes. but look at Japanese regulators, for example. Yeah. The only country where the FTX users were really not affected was Japan. A, because Japan has seen series of failures of crypto ecosystems within the country. B, there are very clear and guidelines, clear guidelines from the regulators how hot wallets will work, how cold wallets will work, and as soon as the user deposits, what happens to those cryptocurrency? Maybe the regulators need to discuss more, like as a, as a crypto company first, I need to discuss with them at the base level as to what we are and how we are solving a problem yes. by bringing, for example, U US dollars. Yes. If I would approach a regulator in Kenya, like we are, um, we are talking about how we want to bring inflows to the country first before working towards the, for the outflows. Yes. B is, uh, as I said, focus more on compliances. So crypto companies often say that there is lack of compliances, my regulator is not telling us what to do, yeah. and therefore we don't have a compliance process. I think that's, that's ridiculous because yes. there is something called as a good housekeeping, right? Uh, we all clean our house, we all clean the dishes, you know, when, when we eat food, right? Nobody's gonna come and tell us like, this is what you're supposed to do. As a crypto company, we are responsible to make sure that we deal with customers yeah. who are KYC. That's yeah. a basic expectation, yes. right? So if we don't follow the basics right and we just bring in new products with half-built uh, buildings, what are they going to regulate? And I think also with, with that, there's two points that spring to mind. So people talk about education when it comes to approaching the regulator, but I think we need to make sure we carefully define what education means. Because education doesn't mean this is how a blockchain work. if, works. If you think about it, when the likes of MTN entered the continent, do you think the regulators truly understood how mobile money worked? No. <laughs> they don't need to. They just needed to understand the benefit. And you're right in the sense that Crypto doesn't have to be, and it isn't just extractive, right? It's not just about money leaving the continent. It also brings money to the continent. It opens opportunities for the continent. And you're completely right that we should be approaching it like that. And also that when it comes to compliance, the way in which you should be thinking is, what is the gold standard globally, right? Go for the, go, if you can adhere to the best regulation, 
it will trickle down and it will also feed into the confidence of regulators. It shows that you're, think, you're taking it seriously and you're Absolutely. thinking ahead of um, the curve. I know you had some points as well um, about this. Uh, yeah, so just a couple of things, right? So I think um, one key thing I've noticed, for example, I was at a pitch event for crypto event for crypto um, companies, and um, so there was a guy pitching on stage, and there were a bunch of investors. These guys want to give you money. They don't care what a dex is. They don't care what is centralized exchange. They don't care like all the big terms and all the technical work. They don't really care. All they want is for you to explain things to them in a way they will understand. Yes. That's all they want. Explain crypto in simple terms. Yes. That's the idea. If someone asks me, what's Polygon? And I'm um, like, you're a technical person. I wouldn't say a bunch of things. I would say, Polygon helps Ethereum with your problems. Yeah. That's how I would put it. It's like, make things simple, simplify terms. And when it comes to regulation, to be honest, I would say um, um, regulators specifically in um, certain countries I would not name, um, specifically... <laughs> The Specif unknown giant. <laughs> <laughs> so specifically, they need to draw people who have their boots on the ground closer to them. Yes. And rather than just like saying what they read online or like what they see. Or for example, they see FTX went down and say, oh, wow, crypto is bad. Technically, um, what happened at FTX was not a crypto problem. It was a human error problem, yeah. not a crypto problem. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But people who don't understand that would say blockchain has failed. It was not a blockchain problem. It was a human error, not a blockchain problem. Yeah. Right, so because technically what happened at FTX was a liquidity problem. People were so, um, Sam, he was taking up money to another company. It's right, also that was fraud. Ex exactly. <laughs> he was taking up money, saying, okay, you have this. Oh, because, okay, okay, let me not go into the FTX. I think we're still going to go into the FTX. We are going to go into the FTX. We're going to get into but, it. You can start answering if you want, but. Okay. <laughs> okay. So specifically, right, um, going back to my last point, we need regulators to draw the people who have their boots on the ground closer yes. to them. Yes. Right? Yeah. Draw them closer and ask them questions, specifically people who knows how to explain things simply. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. How does crypto benefit us? How does it benefit the economy? How? Because... Crypto cannot work in Africa without regulation. You have yeah. to, there has to, at least basic KYC, KYB, there has to be, yeah. right? And if you don't want to be KYC, KYB, you must be doing something fishy. You yeah. must be, right? So there has to be at least a layer of verification that exists, right? And, but my specific point is, number one, right, um, bring the people who have their boots on the ground closer okay. to you as a regulator. Number two, when um, education um, was spoken about, specifically, two people need to be educated. Number one, the general public about how um, crypto works. And like, yeah. um, I think, as he said, the difference between hot, hot wallet, um, cold wallet, what, what are these things? What yeah. are these things? How do they work? What are the differences? What are the benefits, right? So, so um, specifically education across Africa is specifically important and, um, and if you look at Japan as he said um, specifically it did not go um, like south specifically because there was a there was a sound level of education in the economy right there was a bunch of conferences bunch of like news publications talking about how crypto works and like people like literally the, the, the least person understands how these things work they know what to do they say okay should I do this should I not do this like they understand the least things but um, in Africa one, uh, one major problem one major barrier I've seen is that there is no education yeah. There is no education and every single person who is trying to educate are trying to sound the most technical, which is a problem. Everyone is trying to sound like the most technical. Not, no one is trying to simplify things. No one cares about these things. We want reward use cases that people, like people like, like you and I could use. We want products like that you and I could use. That's what we want. Right? And we need to, like, we need to literally break things down that yeah. anybody could understand. It doesn't have to be so complex. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. I think it's not just education, it's also the way products are built. And that is not just here on the continent, it's across, right? So one thing I always say is, why should the average person on the street care? Like, no one, no one is like, oh, it's this blockchain. Like, the average person doesn't care. They have a fundamental thing they want to achieve. Crypto can enable that, make it easy for them, right? Whether that is seed phrases, that's a difficult concept. Sign in a non-custodial wallet. Huh? Like, how do you explain... Yeah, how do you explain that to someone? And personally, I have, for example, I have, other than Bitcoin and USD, like a yeah. stable coin, other than Bitcoin and stable coin, I have never bought anything. Yeah. Uh, of course, I've only bought it to make money. <laughs> but I don't know where am I going to execute that. Yes. Like, how, how am I going to apply that in the real life? Yes, and that, I will come back to that point, because that yes. comes down to infrastructure on the continent as well, and how we connect crypto to more to the real world. But I'll come back to that. But there was something that you mentioned, right, um, around, oh, sorry, around education. 
um, and educating the populace, the masses, about the safety of crypto, custody, etc. Now, one thing that is true about the continent is Africa is generally a low trust environment. <laughs> so, how do we frame trust in a way that enables safe custodian practices? How, what does that look like for the continent? Where I know you had some thoughts. Lots of thoughts. Um, <laughs> so, like, my DNA is product, right? Like, I'm a, pro I'm a product manager at heart. Yeah. You, as a product manager, you're, you are conditioned uh, to simplify, 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 and make things people want. Yeah. Do shit people want to use. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't go out here and build the most convoluted DAO structure that is going to make you sound really smart on a panel. At the end of the day, my mom in Kampala is not going to use it. You know yeah. what I mean? So if, like, when it comes to uh, centralization and, uh, sorry, um, custody, custody and, and good practices in Web3, you have to now simplify it and look at so look at FTX, right? So this is this panel is about FTX. So what did FTX do really well? They did product really, really yeah. well. They made it really easy to use. They made it very easy to understand. Maybe the governance and the whole fraud piece, yeah, that was behind the scenes. Uh, that's what tripped them up eventually. But they initially made it very easy, almost a no-brainer for someone to, to come in and use it. Yeah. And I think that, that this is this is what we should be focusing on in, in, in our communities with, with our regulators, um, you know, abstracting away from all the blockchains, all the tokens, all the, you know, the security and scaling solutions. No one cares. At yeah. the end of the day, like, I want to be able to send money to Kampala and not think about it. Yeah. I want to, I, I, you want know, to I want it to be cheaper. quickly, oh yeah, fast, cheap, um, secure reliable. as well, reliable. Yeah. And, you know, we obviously, like at MFS Africa, our DNA is moving money. We are damn good at that. But moving money ac across borders right now is a race to the bottom. Yes. It is something that is going to be um, very soon, hopefully, I hope, taken over with stable coins. Yes. And at the end of the day, like, our customers, you know, end users don't need to know that they're using crypto even. Uh, they just need to know that, that oh, my transfer is costing me 20% less than it cost me with, with another, with, you know, say, uh, MoneyGram. Um, or say, uh, I'm able to save my money uh, for, that I earned last year and it's, it's holding its value instead of devaluing with my local currency. Like, you, you need to make it that simple. simple. And as a product manager, like, I really adhere to this idea of jobs to be done, exactly. which is what is the job that the customer or the business that you're serving, what is it they want to do? Simplify it way down, break it down, make it as simple as possible for people yeah. to understand and do that damn thing. All, you have to maybe in the background, under the hood, it's going to look quite complicated okay. and messy, but that's your job as a builder. Yes. Um, but the UX, the face of it, should be easy okay. to use, easy to adopt, uh, and scalable. I completely agree with that. As I said, I always say crypto is a means, not an end in itself. And a lot of the time, people treat it like it's an end, like someone should use it. And I, I completely agree with that product mindset. Um, and it's a challenge of crypto more broadly that typically has been led by tech people, right? I'm from a product background, and I always use this equivalent of know who your end user is. So for example, I would say the mum's test. Why should my mum care? And can, if I explain, if I have one minute to explain things to my mother, can she repeat it back to me in a way that is sufficient for her to do what she's trying to achieve? And I don't think enough crypto projects, not just here, generally think of that, right? Um, and you're right. One, inf one fact about the role of stable coins is 80% of intra-African trade leaves the continent. Typically mm. goes through the US, which means that settlement times are greatly increased. Um, it means that costs, we lose billions, billions a year yep. for, um, due to this. Um, and it just is not always reliable. It can take weeks to pay someone, so to go from paying someone in Nigeria paying someone in Kenya which is ridiculous. Um, and so you're right, crypto does have a key role. Now, just to go back to slightly to my, question, to my initial question. So we've spoken about reg what the regulator can do. We've also touched upon what individual companies can do, how, we, how individual companies can take ownership. And I wanted to really think about beyond, so there's this, there's this role of custodians, right? How can custodians evolve and develop to be applicable to the continent, right? Because if you just applied a bit of context, if I may, custodians generally um, are used by larger companies, institutions, because they are expensive to use. They are expensive, they're not necessarily the easiest to use either. But custodians play a real role, especially in centralized exchanges. Um, and so you see a separation in traditional finance between cust custodian and bank. So what, how can we, how, what can we do to make custodians, ex, or custod, custodian pro, um, solutions 
accessible to people on the continent in particular? Sure. Can I answer? Anyone? Can I answer? Me? Okay. Okay. First yeah. you go ahead, then <laughs> I'll add. Okay, so um, specifically, right, I think I will backtrack again to understanding uh, basically to education. Um, uh, if we look at like companies like FTX and Binance and um, other exchanges that you know, um, specifically, um, these are centralized exchanges, and um, specifically, um, okay, how should I put this? Let me think, right? So we have two things. We have centralized exchange, we have the decentralized exchange, right? Um, the average person doesn't need to um, really get to know, um, right, um, this bunch of technicalities. You just need to make it simple enough. They don't even need to know that something's running on the blockchain. You just need mm -hmm. to know they're moving something from one point to another point, and that's all they care about, and that's all they should know, and that's it, right? It's not like sometimes information is destructive. Sometimes if you organize a couple of people, bring a couple of people to, to educate them, there are some things you know, okay, let me withhold these things from them and like simply just like tell them the things that they need to know that will help them understand. Um, we could put it that way. So um, moving on, right? So decentralized exchange, centralized exchange. Specifically, um, FTX was centralized exchange and um, we can see that as the regular banks. And one of the problems that made um, FTX go, or rather, right, we left the regular bank specifically because of what happened at FTX. We don't want a centralized authority over our money. Mm -hmm. FTX is not a bank account. It's mm -hmm. not a bank. But like people thought it was a bank. Yeah. So they go keep their money there and this happened. Because like money was kept there for a long time. Yes. It was billions. Then people felt then the people at the back felt like, hey, this money's out here, no one's using it, it's not yeah. moving. I could simply just take it out and go trade it somewhere. Yeah. Right? We gave them that opportunity. That's what we did. We, it's, simil like, it's not a blockchain problem. It's a problem of a human error. That, that's simply what it is. If you look at what happened in a particular country, right? People are working hard and people are working hard, like they're working for their money and they cannot access their money in a particular country. Mm -hmm. That's a very big problem. So there are infrastructures that exist already to make sure that m basically money gets from one place to another place. But then, hu like, it's a human thing, right? So specifically, right, we need... So when um, the, this uh, uh, sex thing um, came around, that CEX, centralized exchange, came around, the idea was simply, okay, you want to do peer-to-peer -peer exchange, you want to do particular things, right, you could do centralized exchange. But, like, specifically, right, for people who want to hold money, Specifically, think around what's code, how, code wallets, how do they work, yeah. right? So, okay, specifically, we use Metamax. How does Metamax work? You get a seat face, seat face, you get a private key, you get a blah, 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 blah. Some people need to understand how those processes work. But specifically, right, if you want to use a centralized exchange, don't keep your money there and say, hey, I want, I want, I want this money to sit there. Just go to a bank account if that's what you want to do. Yeah. But if you have specific things that you want to do, okay, you can use centralized exchange, that's fine. But, um, like you don't keep money in like in a custodial wallet just say i want to keep this money here and just leave it there like you're giving these people the opportunity to use your money for something else because it's going to be there for a long time if you want to keep it there for a long time use, use a decentralized wallet use a metamax put it so that in that case only you have access to your money the only problem the only downside is if you lose your seed face yes. or something you like it's gone and that that's it well like but i guess that's the power of custodians right and the whole premise is that they are institutions that there's ways you can abstract the difficulty, mm -hmm. right? One is making the product easier. Yeah. So you can use the likes of Web3 Auth, right? So that it abstracts the need for seed phrases, etc. Mm -hmm. But the other one is having institutions that abstract that for you. And exactly. so I guess, uh, could please continue. I, I, I guess I was just a uh, yeah. challenge, slight <laughs> challenge. Yeah. yeah, to be honest, right? So. I think um, specifically, even when it comes to centralized exchanges, people just need to understand that if I'm leaving the regular bank account system um, and I'm coming to say, hey, I want to move money easily on the blockchain side, okay, understand what you are doing. Don't just come into the, don't just come into the request and say, hey, I'm, using, I'm on Binance, I keep all my salary here, I keep all my money here. It's a centralized exchange and there are people who are called centralized authority at the back. I don't see the difference between that and the bank. The difference is that simply you're still working on the blockchain, but still, there's still centralized authority. But, um, um, where I'm going here with this specifically is, right, um, these guys, we, we need to, don't, like, don't give them all the power they need because if you're keeping all your money, you're giving them the same power you give the banks. Yeah. That's the idea. And if we're seeing the blockchain, right, technically you're doing the same thing. 
we're doing the same thing literally but like if you know you want to hold that level of amount of money on so specifically this is for people who are holding large sum of amount of money but like the idea still scaling crypto in Africa is creating real world use cases that like people in the markets could use people like basically moving money easily and cheaper and like they don't really need to know how the blockchain works as simple as that I guess my only challenge to that is I think storage in the context of Africa is a real use case because unfortunately the look on the continent we have currencies that are devaluating at ridiculous rates only country that I've come across so far where it wasn't where it's gotten stronger in the last year or so is actually Zambia hmm. oddly mm. yes 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 Shout we all should look into Zambia it's not yeah. a country that people think about but it's a very interesting one but I, I, I guess just to, just to move on I'm cognizant of time and we haven't We've kind of skirted around the issue, um, but I wanted to discuss FTX, right? The real elephant in the room, you know. Um, how can we, need, we've, we've kind of touched upon it, but to summarize, how do you think, like what are the key points that we need to take away to prevent another FTX from happening on the continent? I'll give one minute, I'll okay. give one minute response. <laughs> so avoid this by, governance, 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 and regulation, just yeah. making sure that like our regulators on our, and also the governance structures we have in place are robust enough to actually protect consumers, protect businesses. Second thing is, is one of the learnings we got from FTX was that centralization can be good. Yes. It can be, it's bad when the governance is terrible and yes. when there's no regulation, but in some ways it can be very good for adoption, making adoption quite easy, yes. making um, you know, education of the product very, very uh, easy to use, building for the customer's job to be done. So that is something that I, I want to take away from the FTX situation. The fraud, the, you know, the celebrity, uh, the nonsense of all that, let's leave that behind. But um, if we can find a way to mix DeFi, CeFi, uh, in a way that is accessible and actually solves for customer problems, let's do that. And, and I think custody is, is probably is one of the biggest uh, challenges we, we, should, we should start looking at. Uh, this is regarding FTX, right? Yeah. I think number one is uh, the people, uh, the consumers, they must change their outlook first. Uh, us as crypto community, we are very easy, uh, I mean in the sense, we appoint our role models very easily. Mm -hmm. And our role models are people who make money. That's the most unfortunate part of True. this industry. So I think the mindset, each one of us present in this room, must change this mindset of saying, he's my role model or she's my role model. Because that's where the problem starts, because you start trusting that institution or that individual um, unlimitedly, right? The other thing is, okay, you can take inspirations from them, but also in terms of custody, you know, even the S uh, SEC chair last week came out with uh, this, uh, this hashtag, not your seats, not your wallets. So how hard is it for users to understand if you do not have the seeds of your wallet, it's not yours. It's like you're giving your house key to somebody else and saying, please take care of my house. So mm -hmm. do, we, do we do that in our real life? No, we don't. No. So till the time that mindset is, doesn't change or it, the, the shift is, doesn't happen, I think these we'll have more of FTX coming in. Yeah. The worries are not over for the crypto industry, in my opinion. We have seen uh, you know, about staking how US took a very strong step and uh, mm -hmm. rightly so in my opinion. And the other thing is also um, like on the stable coin, like, you know, Paxos, Kraken being fine and stuff. So I think a, a gradual growth is always what we should aim for. Mm -hmm. Crypto entrepreneurs are looking for an instant growth. So for such things not to happen again, I think as users, we have to be under full control of our assets. Don't trust anybody unlimitedly. Right, and the other thing is, just use a company if till the time you think that they're serving your needs. If you think that they're not serving the needs, and don't have role models of people, as I said before, who are rich, who are successful. I mean, companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft—they are not silly people. Like you know, they spent years yeah. building a product, and in the crypto world, all of a sudden we see these billionaires. In fi in five years, they have become the richest people on on, on the planet. So. Uh, this is what I feel, this is more to do with common sense than uh, actual business really. 
So I want to move on to hear your thoughts, but very quickly, um, I know you also had, you wanted to explain this, like a point about custody and um, like custodian projects and institutions in one minute. I think I've covered on that You've aspect, covered, okay, but okay. Uh, you know, as I don't want to brag about what we do, but we don't offer wallets to our users. Mm -hmm. We tell them, bring your wallets, and we prefer cold wallets on the platform, whitelist your wallets, as soon as you purchase your assets, take them with you. Don't even trust us. And we keep saying cryptos is decentralized, blockchain is decentralized. Are we truly decentralized? And you, you know, so these are some basic questions that as the entrepreneurs and as users, we should um, ask, ask ourselves. I think actually in the context of the continent, we are actually more decentralized than we realize because there are more there are more non-custodial wallet users on the continent than any fintech. The number of users is bigger than any single fintech user on the continent. So we're actually more decentralized than we realize. But we're going to come back to that point because that comes down to infrastructure as well in terms of how you access yeah. it. But Ali, you know, what are your thoughts on this? How do we avoid FTX, custodian point, etc.? Yeah, without taking much of the time, just like uh, Guerra mentioned, I think regulation is still key in you know, solving all of these problems. And because crypto is actually meant to be, you know, as easy as sending a test message. Right? Yes. But because of the fact that we're pre user experience is still, you know, I would not say bad, but of course, generally it's still not for everyone, right? Because of the fact that, you know, using a DeFi wallet, a MetaMask, you have to, you know, go through a lot of processes. You know, you don't expect, like, for example, my mom in Nigeria to go through all of these processes before yeah. you can send money, yeah. right? She's, so not, she's not going to. Exactly, <laughs> right? So I think we need to, like, keep finding a way to, like, make, you know, decentral, uh, decentralization more easier, right? Mm -hmm. You know, more easier, like, you are taking your phone, phone and you know, you're just t sending a test message, right? Until we are able to do that, uh, we still need to, like, just make sure that regulation is really hard on yeah. uh, all decentralized ways. Because centralization is... It's not entirely bad, right? No. Mm -hmm. But if you have the right regulation in place, right, yes. all of these would definitely be solved. I Fix think the UX. I think that you, may, you touched upon an interesting point, right, which is it, it's that infrastructure point. And when people think about crypto, unfortunately, it's very much led by the narrative of exchanges. That's what we all think of. But there's this unsexy industry or world of on and off ramping, which is so fundamental. So for the benefit of the crypto newbies, on-ramping is when you go from fiat to crypto. So think of it getting on the crypto train. Off-ramping is the reverse, so going from crypto to fiat. Now, we have a lot, there's businesses, that's a business in itself. There are many huge companies in the West, and they claim to service Africa, but they don't. Um, because in reality, in the context of the continent, on and off ramping looks very different, right? We have mobile money players, which are huge. We have the fact that you can't do direct on and off ramps in some countries, so you have to do P to P. And it's something that, that was actually the first thing I built in crypto, a non-custodial on and off ramping protocol. And so it's something that's very close to my heart. And interestingly, I know Cello is doing, I'm not going to say what I know, but I know there's stuff, and loads of people, there's something called PNS, which is emerging, which isn't it's separate from Cello, which is looking at how you can connect your mobile phone to a wallet. So it makes it easier. It almost mimics mobile money um, more closely. But I guess when it comes to that infrastructure point, what, what do you think is missing that it means that uh, crypto adoption in Africa isn't accelerating in the way it could or should. I'm trying to think who should go. Oh, he, he put his hand up first. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so to be honest, right, taking crypto information from Africa would not happen if there is no at least a level of centralization. There has to be. Mm -hmm. Because specifically, we're not talking about developers here. We're not talking about business people. We're talking about the people in the market. We're talking about people on the road. We're talking about people in, in, in the rural areas, like people who don't know jack about anything, right? But we need to understand that still, when the bank accounts, crew, when bank accounts came, right, so the local farmer has to go to the bank and say, hey, I want to open a bank account, right? You have to provide some documents, but technically you don't know what's going on. You're, you just lose, you're typing some things on your laptop and some things are going on, blah, blah, blah. You just don't specifically know what's going on, right? And these guys have their money, but then technically you don't wake up one morning and say, hey, Zenit Bank just 
You don't have your money anymore. Because of why? A level of regulation exists, mm -hmm. right? So centralization is a must, at least to an extent, and regulation is a must. These two things. But I was going to go back to the last thing I said before, yeah. or not the last thing, but like one of the things I said. Yeah. <laughs> so specifically, um, there has, like, these people have to draw people who have their boots on the ground closer to them yes. as specifically advisors who can basically guide them and say, hey, okay, we can do things this way. Because, for example, when I joined Polygon, one key thing that, um, one key structure or, or one key strategy I used was specifically, if we're trying to basically get people to understand crypto or what's going on in the Web3 space, we have to basically create similar structures that they are familiar with. You don't come over to Web3 and, like, you're hearing, in, like, buzzwords, like it's all around. You don't understand what's going on. You're confused. You yeah. have to create similar structure that, okay, they come over here and they say, okay, okay, ah, I see. So it yeah, give them similarities to like what you see in the Web2 space. So this is just simple, but on the blockchain, that's how it works. So specifically, right, um, if, it's, if we're talking mainstream, we're talking about regulation, we're talking about a level of centralization, which is a must, because like, it, it, there's, there's really nothing you can do about it, right? It's just that, for example, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna build a use case example here. So if we're looking at crypto, right, so we, we look at, okay, I want to create a crypto on your mobile phone or something, yes. then you go somewhere, somebody helps you put do the entire structure, that kind of yeah. thing, and before you know it, bam, it's working on your mobile phone and that's it. You don't have to go back there to do any other thing. You don't have to think about anything else, same way you do with your bank account, and you don't even have to think about the blockchain, right? But in the, for, the, for the starting point, right, you have to go somewhere to start the initial process. I guess, so I definitely agree with regulation. I would love, we're probably going to have a debate off stage about whether it needs to be centralized, because I don't think it does. I think it just, we just need better user experience for mm -hmm. non-custodial and self-custodial wallets or, and platforms and decentralized platforms. But we'll come, we'll come, back, to, we'll, we'll come back to that off stage. Um, I know you had a point that you wanted to share It's, about it's a very quick point. I want, uh, you know, just to respect the organizers as well. But uh, I think what is really required in Africa is infrastructure company. Yeah. And uh, to answer your question, you said, like, why did a lot of companies from the West who tried to build a business here on ramps and off ramps? And yeah. what was the problem? I think the problem was everybody is trying to onboard B to C. Mm -hmm. Like, companies are not looking at B to B to C or B to B to B to C. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as a company, we, we won't say what uh, the details, what we are doing, but exactly the infrastructure, compliances, liquidity, and movement of money via bank wires is all what we are focusing, but not for retail users, but for businesses or crypto and non-crypto companies who either want crypto adoption or want a use case for cryptos. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what is required in this continent, really. I you have to just do the basics right. I completely agree. Um, I think, so I'm cognizant, I can see someone hovering off stage, um, which means we are running out of time. So I guess to summarize the key points that I've taken away is education on the one hand for the consumer um, that's understanding what projects are, what they exist and there are things that are coming out that make that easier. So there's a project that's coming out called Emerging on Chain that is kind of trying to capture what are these venture backed companies, how do they work, you know, what, what does it mean, etc. And then also this education for the regulator in a non-technical, hey, crypto is an amazing way, but more in a utility first way. That's one thing. The second thing is the thing we were talking about is infrastructure. Um, is really fundamental and localized infrastructure as well. Don't just copy and paste, which I think generally in the continent we're okay at avoiding, but be really cognizant of that. The other thing is regula regulation. We need it. We can't avoid it. But... Oh, for anyone who is a regulator, friends of a regulator, seen a regulator in the distance, collaborate with us. There are co countries on the continent that are open to that, but not enough. So please, please, to your family, to your friends, your aunts and uncles who are friends of regulations, regulators, we are here. We want to speak. We want to engage. Um, and then the other thing is a debate around custody and self-custody. Centralized solutions can work with, reg with the right regulation and support, and also crypto companies taking ownership when it comes to compliance. But self-custody can also work when you think about the true jobs to be done and make sure that the user experience is one that anyone can do in their sleep. And those are the key points. So thank you for joining the What the FTX. 
very excited that we can now start using that as a curse word. I will be using it internally <laughs> when things go, if things go wrong. The <laughs> what the FTX. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully you've enjoyed this panel as much as I have. And thank you so thank much you. as well for joining me on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. All right.